greatest mysteries of mankind is where did we come from? Scientists and philosophers alike have pondered this elusive question and put forth many explanations. But in truth, no one really knows. Good evening. I'm Charlton Heston. In their search for answers, scientists gather evidence and develop theories based on what they observe. But sometimes evidence turns up that completely contradicts this. Footprints resembling modern man's were discovered in Texas, side by side with dinosaur tracks. Does this mean that man lived millions of years ago, at the time of the dinosaur? These 70-ton blocks were somehow transported to the Peruvian mountain temple of Ollantaytambo. The only source of this red granite is five miles away on the peak of another mountain. Ancient maps have been discovered which correctly depict the continent of Antarctica centuries before it was discovered by Europeans. Some claim this is evidence of a technologically advanced culture that existed before recorded history began. Tonight we'll examine these and other controversial findings to see if what we're being taught about the origins of man is supported by the evidence. We'll meet a new breed of scientific investigators who claim that the history of man on this planet may be radically different than what is accepted today. Before the 19th century, Western man looked to the Bible for an explanation of his origins. In the story of Genesis, God created man from the dust of the earth 6,000 years ago. But when man dug into the earth for answers, he found evidence that appeared to tell a different story. Evolution. In 1859, Charles Darwin published his book, The Origin of Species. This book put forth the revolutionary idea that all life on earth could be explained by the workings of nature. Instead of a supreme being creating the diversity of life, the theory of evolution proposes that accidental changes in nature are the cause. These changes are governed by the process of natural selection, survival of the fittest. Over the past two centuries, archaeologists have collected bones and artifacts that suggest there's a logical sequence of evolutionary steps from ape to man. Man's earliest relatives were ape-like beings who appeared around 25 million years ago. The first of those to walk upright emerged 20 million years later. Over the remaining 5 million years, he continued to evolve, passing through various stages of development until modern man, like ourselves, emerged over 100,000 years ago. Archaeologists determine the age of artifacts by the level of strata or layer of earth they're found in. Recent artifacts associated with modern man are generally found close to the surface, while older, more primitive artifacts are in deeper layers of the ground. But sometimes artifacts are found that break all the rules. Archaeologists call them anomalous artifacts. What happens when we find a modern human skull? in rock strata far beneath even the oldest of man's ancestors. In their controversial book, Forbidden Archaeology, Michael Cremo and Dr. Richard Thompson have documented hundreds of these anomalous artifacts which have yet to be explained. The basic body of evidence that we've uncovered in this book suggests that uh, human beings of modern anatomical type have been existing for many, many millions of years into the past. In 1880, California state geologist J.D. Whitney was intrigued by an unexpected discovery made 300 feet under Table Mountain. While digging for gold, miners unearthed a variety of stone tools, such as mortar and pestles and ladles. Incredibly, the rock strata the tools were reportedly found in was dated as early as 55 million years old. Whitney made a thorough report in these finds and came to an unsettling conclusion. Man could be millions of years older than the current evolutionary model suggests. This bizarre evidence seems to have been well documented, yet the general public and many within the scientific community are unaware of these controversial finds. The question is, why haven't we heard of these discoveries before? 
Oh, I think we're talking about a massive cover-up. Uh, as I said, over the past 150 years, uh, these archaeologists and anthropologists have covered up as much evidence as they've dug up, literally. Basically, what you find is uh, something we call a knowledge filter. This is a fundamental feature of science. It's also a fundamental feature of human nature. People tend to filter out things that don't fit, that don't make sense in terms of their paradigm or their way of thinking. So in science, you find that evidence that doesn't fit the accepted paradigm tends to be eliminated. It's not taught, it's not discussed, and people who are educated in, in scientific teachings generally don't even learn about it. Conventional theory states that modern man originated in southern Africa around 100,000 years ago. From there, he migrated north into Europe and southern Asia, continued through Asia and crossed the Bering Strait into the New World around 30,000 years ago. He then came down through North America and finally arrived in South America around 15,000 years ago. Yet numerous artifacts have been found across North and South America that are so old they threaten to completely overturn this theory. According to geologist Virginia Steen McIntyre, she was silenced at the height of her career because of her determination to report the facts. In the summer of 1966, a collection of stone tools, including this leaf-shaped spear point, was uncovered at Hoyatlico, Mexico. To find out exactly how old the spear points were, a team of experts from the United States Geological Survey was called in to date them. When we first began to work on the Wayatlaco site, we thought we had an old site. This was back in 66, and we thought it was perhaps 20,000 years old, and at that time that was considered a very old age for the site. We did what they call radiometric dates, which gives an actual date range. And we used two different methods to do that. One was using uranium uh, atoms, another one was using little zircon crystals. When we finally got the dates and all the different methods we used to date it, it came out to be 250,000 years old. To tell you the truth, I would have been happy with a 20,000-year-old date. It would have made my career. It was very old for the time, but it wasn't so old that it was that controversial. People can take 20,000-year steps. They can't take steps that are over 200,000 years at one time. And I was rather naive. I thought, okay, we've got something big here, but I'm just going to stick with the date. We've got the information, we've got the facts, let's get the facts out and go on from there. And I didn't realize it was going to ruin my whole career. According to Dr. McIntyre, because she stuck to the facts, all of her professional opportunities were closed off. She's not worked in her chosen field since. The site was closed and permission for further investigation was denied forever. It's not necessarily a deliberate conspiracy in the sense of some people getting together in a smoke-filled room and saying, we're going to de uh, deceive people. It's something that happens automatically within the scientific community. So when a given piece of evidence disagrees with the predominant theory, then automatically people won't talk about it, they won't report it, and that means that science fails to progress in the way that one would hope. Dinosaurs left their tracks on this riverbank 100 million years ago. Did humans walk here at the same time? Next, a man who claims these prints are proof that humans lived with the dinosaurs. Ever since dinosaurs were first discovered in the 18th century, they've fascinated people of all ages. The Tyrannosaurus rex stood over 30 feet in height. He's considered the most ferocious predator ever to walk the earth. A brontosaurus grew to the length of three city buses. He weighed more than 90 tons. The reign of the dinosaur ended, according to one theory, when a giant meteor crashed into the earth with the force of thousands of hydrogen bombs. A cloud of dust was raised, which blocked the sun for years. This marked the end of the dinosaurs. According to conventional scientific theory, no human beings were alive then to witness these events. Or were they? Over a hundred million years ago, the limestone bedrock of the Paluxy River in Texas was a muddy plain. It was here that countless dinosaurs left their footprints to be fossilized and preserved forever. But the tracks of another creature have also been preserved in these banks. 
possibly the tracks of man. Archaeologist Carl Bau has led the investigation of these controversial prints for over 12 years. My reaction was one of shock. I had heard of human footprints being found in this locale uh, on the Paluxy near Glen Rose, Texas, but I was rather skeptical. And uh, here, after removing actual rock layers, the team and I excavated a series of dinosaur footprints and 18 and one half inches from one of those dinosaur footprints, we excavated a 16 inch human footprint. We excavated 12 footprints in a series. And when you find a trail with left, right, left, right pace and stride, the right distance apart, then you have to interpret this as belonging to uh, humankind. It's been claimed the Luxie River footprints are a hoax carved into the limestone bedrock as a tourist attraction. Well, we found trails leading under limestone ledges and actually removed the limestone ledges one slab of rock at a time. And we found that both the dinosaur footprints and the trail of human footprints continued under the rock ledges. This evidence is real. Today, many of the so-called human prints have fallen victim to erosion and the hands of vandals. But Carl Bau is in possession of one of the most compelling prints ever found. What you are about to see is the most controversial artifact in his collection. I first saw the Burdick print on my initial visit to Glen Rose in 1984. My impression at that time was that it was too perfect. But it's clearly a human footprint demonstrating the heel section the arch, the base of the metatarsals, the first or great toe, second, third, fourth, and fifth toe. After our examination of this print, we find that it definitely is in the Cretaceous uh, limestone, in the same formation with the dinosaur footprints. Here we're looking at a cross section, and we can see very obvious following contours under the great toe, and actually structures under each one where we see the calcite inclusion, the force was concentrated and produced these load-bearing structures, which are exactly what geologists look for. We have eliminated uh, the idea that it's carved. It definitely is original impression in the sediment. This is said to be the fossilized finger of a human being. It too was reportedly found in the same strata as the dinosaur tracks, dating to over a hundred million years old. It had what appeared to be a nail, what appeared to be a cuticle, a taper, a humanoid shape. After I saw the CAT scan, there was no longer any room in my mind for doubt. This scan shows the shape of the finger. It shows tissue beneath the skin of the finger. It shows the bone. It shows the joints. It shows a ligament. That tells me this is a human finger. The limestone layer that preserved these artifacts is reportedly dated at around 135 million years old. Yet, as we saw earlier, objects have been found in rock strata much older than this. In Klerksdorp, South Africa, hundreds of metallic spheres were found by miners in Precambrian strata, said to be a fantastic 2.8 billion years old. The controversy centers around the fine grooves encircling some of the spheres. Lab technicians were at a loss to explain how they could have been formed by any known natural process. According to the curator of the Klerksdorp Museum, Rolf Mars, the spheres are a complete mystery. They look man-made, yet at the time in Earth's history when they came to rest on this rock, no intelligent life existed. They're like nothing I've ever seen before. Author researcher David Hatcher Childress has written numerous articles on the coexistence of humans and dinosaurs. I think that one of the solutions to the paradox of dinosaurs and people together and the vast discrepancy in time 
This, the whole timeline of, of millions of years versus only thousands of years can be explained in a cataclysmically geological view of the past, where rather than geological events taking place over millions of years, they take place more quickly. And what is a million years on a geological time scale is in fact only, say, a thousand years. And therefore, it's going to bring all this dating much closer to us and make it possible so that in a scientific way, man and dinosaurs can have existed together in the past. And in fact, dinosaurs can still be alive today in small numbers in remote areas of the world. For instance, in 1977, a Japanese fishing boat off New Zealand brought up out of the water the carcass of what appeared to be a pleliosaur, an animal that should have been extinct for millions of years. Although the authenticity of this photograph has never been disproved, skeptics have claimed it's merely the body of a decomposing shark. We've seen a broad range of evidence, some of it highly speculative, but there are enough well-documented cases to call for a closer look at the conventional explanation of man's origins, the theory of evolution. England is the birthplace of evolution's first champion, Charles Darwin. Darwin's theory of evolution proposes that simple life forms or species evolve into more complex species by accidental changes over long periods of time. For example, given five million years, an ape can evolve into a man. Since Darwin's time, his theory has become central to our understanding of how man came into existence. It's almost universally accepted today. But according to science investigator Richard Milton, Darwin's theory of how man evolved from the apes has some critical problems. The building behind me is London's Natural History Museum. It looks rather like a cathedral or a church, and in a way that's what it is. It's a kind of temple to Darwin's theory of evolution. People come to museums like the Natural History Museum to get answers to their question. Have we evolved from apes? Do humans and apes share a common ancestor? And to look at an exhibit like this, you'd think that question had been answered decisively yes. But the answer is far from decisive. In fact, this representation is an interpretation of the fossils, the interpretation of one group of scientists. There are other interpretations, but you won't find them in this museum or any other museum in the world. In the model of the evolutionary tree, man and apes are said to share a common ancestor. However, evidence of that common ancestor is highly contested. That's why it is still called the missing link. When Darwin's theory of evolution was embraced, it was assumed that in the next century, enough fossil evidence would be found to prove that man had evolved from the apes. Darwinists have promised us a missing link, and so they've got to deliver. They've got to come up with one. Uh, any missing link will do, it seems. Uh, every so often, a skeleton is found in Africa, its uh, discoverers describe it as being the missing link, the headlines come and go, and then later on, that skeleton, th those bones are reclassified either as human or as ape. And so far, the missing link is still missing. One of the most classic examples of this is the story of Java Man, discovered by Eugene Dubois in 1892. Dubois discovered a very primitive looking ape-like skull cap and he discovered this thigh bone about 40 feet away. He said, well, obviously they must belong to the same creature. And that creature walked erect like a, a human being and had an ape-like skull, so that must be a missing link, the Pithecanthropus ape man. So maybe you had a big ape and a, a human being living together in Java about a million years ago. The important point to make about the Java man discovery is that it's based on a speculative leap in which two pieces of evidence are put together in a way that's not really warranted. At the end of his life, Dubois realized that the skull cap belonged to a large ape and the leg bone was from a man. Nevertheless, Java Man was prominently displayed at the Museum of Natural History in New York until 1984. Since then, it has been removed. Today, museums all over the world display models of yet another skeleton they call the missing link, the common ancestor of both man and ape. Lucy, you know, the famous australopithecine uh, discovered by Donald Johansson, he says she was very human-like, 
but I was at a conference of anthropologists where many of them were making a case that she was hardly distinguishable from an ape or a monkey. These bones have been restored to resemble a missing link, part human, part ape. And Lucy is now thought of as being our long-lost ancestor. But this is merely an interpretation, the interpretation of one group. Those same bones can be, and they have been taken by scientists, and identified as simply an extinct ape. Nothing to do with us at all. The newspapers are constantly reporting new discoveries that add to our understanding of man's origins, but so far, conclusive evidence of a missing link has not been found. So what happens to the evolutionary model if the missing link does not exist at all? Without it, there's little support for man's connection with the apes, and the model simply collapses. Some people have said to me, how can you criticize a theory if you can't, if you don't have something to replace it with? Well, I don't accept that. If the emperor hasn't got any clothes on, then the emperor hasn't got any clothes on. It's not my fault. It seems to me that if Darwinism is wrong, then somebody has got to point the finger. Next, we will visit the mysterious city of Tiahuanaco, built at an altitude of 12 and a half thousand feet, with stones weighing 150 tons. This could be the oldest city in the world, built by a civilization as yet unknown. In order to unravel the mystery of man's origins, we must follow the path of civilization. A civilization is said to have spread from the old world to the new world, but there is evidence that humans were building cities in the new world thousands of years before history tells us. Traditionally, the oldest city in the world is thought to be Jericho, in the Old World, dated to around 8,000 BC. Yet in South America, the so-called New World, scientists are looking at evidence of a city that could be twice as old. Situated at an altitude of 12 and a half thousand feet, Tiahuanaco is one of the most mysterious cities in the world. Traditionally, it's thought to have been built by the predecessors of the Incas 2,000 years ago. However, around the turn of the century, Bolivian scholar Arthur Poznanski began a 50-year study of the ruins of Tiahuanaco. Using the science of astronomy, Poznanski came to an amazing conclusion. He calculated that Tiahuanaco had been constructed more than 17,000 years ago, long before any civilization was supposed to have existed. Poznanski called this fabulous city the cradle of civilization. Even though the accuracy of Poznanski's measurements were confirmed by engineers, his conclusions about the age of Tiahuanaco have never been accepted. Neil Steedy, a Mesoamerican archaeologist, decided to reopen this controversial investigation. I met with Dr. Oswaldo Rivera, who is head of Bolivian archaeology. The doctor, though he disagrees with Poznanski's findings, was more than willing to help in every way possible so that we could retrace Poznanski's steps. Neil visited Dr. Rivera's newest excavation site, the Acapana Pyramid. Today, it's mostly in ruins, but the base is miraculously preserved and still testifies to the advanced capability of its builders. The facing stones of this site are perfectly set with no mortar. We took a needle, and that needle we tried to insert at every point along the joint, and the needle couldn't be inserted. A perfect fit. One of the most baffling questions for Poznanski was why they built Tiwanaku with such precision. This, he felt, was an important clue to the age of the structure. Now, the ancients constructed the site with astronomical alignments in mind. As the sun rises each day, it moves along the horizon and arises in a different spot. To measure this movement, they built the temple itself as a giant clock to tell them how the progression of the sun was proceeding. 
and we can use those same astronomical alignments to date the site. Poznanski observed that on the first day of spring, the sun rose exactly in the center of the temple through the archway. Based on the layout of the temple, he deduced that on the first days of winter and summer, the sun should rise directly over each of the huge cornerstones. But he found this was not the case. The position of the sun was, for some reason, slightly outside of the corner markers. He wondered what that reason was. In Tiwanaku and in the other ancient sites surrounding it, the architecture is perfectly aligned to the cardinal points. The buildings are deliberately oriented to the cardinal points. But if we measure each building precisely, we will find errors. I believe these are simple errors of construction, not at all related to the date of construction. After observing the perfection with which this site is built with 100 ton stones to suggest that such things as the solstice markers are misaligned, I find incredible. No, I think the solstice markers were probably very precisely located as everything else in the site. And in fact, this is the very argument that Poznanski used to calculate the antiquity of the site. By measuring the angle of the cornerstones and comparing that angle to today's sunrise position, Poznanski was able to calculate that Tiwanaku was built 17,000 years ago. At that time, the tilt of the Earth's axis was slightly different than it is today. So the summer and winter suns would have risen directly above the ancient cornerstones. The only correction that I would make is that we now have better astronomical measurements due to satellites and computers. And I would suspect the date would be more like 12,000 years ago. But that still makes Tiwanaku the oldest city known on the face of the Earth. In his Chronicles of Peru, written in the 1600s, Garcia de la Vega wrote that when the Spanish first arrived in South America, they asked the Incas who built this incredible city of Tiwanaku. Did you build it? The Incas said, no. In fact, they laughed at the idea. They said, we had nothing to do with it. This was built thousands of years before our time. The current view says that man arrived in South America around 15,000 years ago, a wandering hunter-gatherer. Yet the evidence we've seen suggests that Tiwanaku was designed by an advanced civilization. A chance discovery reveals just how advanced they may have been. While restoring the ancient temple of Pumapunka, Dr. Rivera and his team discovered a long-lost secret of the ancient builders. They found a strange depression between two blocks of stone. Upon clearing out the debris, they noticed the unmistakable glint of metal. Whoever built Tiwanaku came up with a very ingenious method for holding together the huge stones which they used to build the site. They carved a groove in the edge, and into this groove they would pour a molten alloy, which later hardened into a staple. What I find amazing here is that to move to each site where the staple was needed, they had to have something like a portable smelting plant to maintain this metal in a molten state. Mysterious metal clamps revealed a level of technology far beyond their time. The antiquity and the technological sophistication of Tiwanaku should make each and every one of us fully question the origins of civilization. Where did the ancient Tiwanakans learn this complex process? The answer may lie halfway around the world at one of man's most mysterious monuments, the Great Sphinx of Egypt. Is it possible that there was an advanced civilization on this planet thousands of years before history tells us? Investigative journalist Graham Hancock considers this to be a very real possibility. 
He has dedicated nine years of his life to tracking down the evidence. This monument is one of a category of monuments from all over the world. These monuments have certain things in common. First and foremost, enormous blocks of stone, gigantic, weighing hundreds of tons. Secondly, very precise, scientific astronomical alignments. And thirdly, the greatest mystery of all, we don't know who built these monuments. Hancock points to a number of sites throughout the world which exhibit gigantic stone construction. This is called megalithic architecture. The immense fortress of Sacsayhuaman in Peru is comprised of individual granite stones, some weighing 360 tons. That's the equivalent of two diesel locomotives. The Osirian in Egypt is made of tremendous pillars of red Aswan granite, some of which weigh over 100 tons. My own view is that what we're looking at here is a common influence that touched all of these places long before recorded history began. A remote third-party civilization unidentified by historians that had a presence in Mexico, that had a presence in South America, that had a presence in Egypt and elsewhere, and that left behind a legacy of knowledge in all of those places. In 1993, an independent Egyptologist, John Anthony West, shocked the world with geological evidence that the Sphinx in Egypt could be 12,000 years old. Recently, astronomer-engineer Robert Boval, using a computer model of the Giza Plateau, made a startling discovery which seems to confirm this ancient age of the Sphinx. In very simple terms, the first thing that one realizes when you look at the pyramids of Giza is that they're designed along astronomical principles. We're finding that the astronomy is leading us to conclude that the Sphinx was erected in 10,500 BC. And this matches exactly with the ideas that have been developed in the geological analysis of the Sphinx. So there are two hard sciences now indicating that the Sphinx could be very, very old and going back to the 11th millennium BC. According to Graham Hancock, if Tiwanaku and the Sphinx were both built around 12,000 years ago, they may have had a common source. Consider these similarities between the Americas and Egypt. Both have huge pyramids, precisely aligned to the cardinal points. Temples with megalithic stones, with extremely fine joints of less than a fiftieth of an inch. Both Egypt and the Americas used royal headdresses of similar style. Both employed a unique style of construction using L-shaped corners. Both used the same style of metal clamps to hold huge stones in place. And both cultures used the process of mummification to preserve and honor their dead. These compelling similarities between Egypt and the Americas suggest to some that a sophisticated group of seafaring people crossed the Atlantic thousands of years before Columbus. A collection of ancient maps suggests they may have had a knowledge of the world which has never been explained. In 1929, rolled up on a dusty shelf in a library in Constantinople in Turkey, a map was found. This map had been drawn in 1513 by a Turkish admiral, Admiral Piri Reis. The strange thing about this map is it shows features of the Earth that nobody in 1513 should have been able to know. Before the 18th century, sailors ran the risk of crashing their ships onto rocky coastlines because they lacked one thing, the ability to calculate longitude. For that, you need an extremely accurate clock. It wasn't until 1790 that the first accurate marine timepiece was invented and sailors could pinpoint their position on the seas. Yet 250 years before this clock was made, Piri Reis had drawn a map which showed the coastlines of Africa and South America within a half a degree of longitude. And as Piri Reis himself told us, that knowledge was not his knowledge. It was knowledge that he'd borrowed and copied from earlier maps. And he stated on the map that it was based on more than 20 source maps. 
and that some of these maps went back to the time of Alexander the Great or even earlier, in other words, to before the time of Christ. So the mystery is, where did these source maps come from? Who charted the globe long ages ago with an accuracy that we ourselves can hardly match today? A professor of science at Charles Hapgood was combing through the map room at the Library of Congress when he made a startling discovery. As my eyes fell upon the southern hemisphere of a world map drawn by Arontius Phineas in 1532, I had the instant conviction that I had found here a truly authentic map of the real Antarctica. The mystery of this map is it shows Antarctica as it looks under the ice long before Antarctica is even supposed to have been discovered. And perhaps the greatest mystery of all uh, is that it shows the Antarctic Peninsula, not as it looks today, covered by more than a mile of ice, but as it actually looks underneath that covering of ice. Now we ourselves have only known what the land under the Antarctic Peninsula really looks like since 1958 when seismic surveys were taken across the ice cap. Hapgood put his theory to the test. He compared the Arontius Phineas map with the map of Antarctica as it looks covered with ice. The maps were similar, but details of the coastline were obscured by the ice. Then, using a map created by seismographic survey, he was able to compare the actual coastlines of Antarctica with the Arontius Phineas map. When the maps were overlaid, the similarities astounded him. The clearest deduction of all is that whoever drew up those original source maps thousands of years ago had a level of technology as high as our own. They had explored the whole globe from north to south and from east to west. So this is testimony of an advanced and as yet unidentified civilization in remote prehistory. A woolly mammoth was frozen so quickly that its last meal of buttercups remained fresh in its stomach for thousands of years. But this sudden drop in temperature may be a clue to the disappearance of the unidentified civilization Plato called Atlantis. If a technologically advanced culture did live on the Earth thousands of years ago, what happened to them? The Greek philosopher Plato described an advanced civilization whose legend was preserved by Egyptian priests. As the story goes, Atlantis was a great empire of engineers and scientists who were in many ways more technologically advanced than we are today. It was destroyed 12,000 years ago by floods and earthquakes, forcing its survivors to seek refuge all over the world. For centuries, scientists and explorers have searched in vain for a continent that fits Plato's description of Atlantis. So far, no sign of this vast island empire has been found. Some say it sank into the Atlantic Ocean. Others say it was destroyed by the volcanic eruption of Thera in the Mediterranean. But researcher Rand Flemath believes he's found a location that no one else has ever considered. Atlantis, he says, is buried under two miles of ice. Up until now, uh, the search for Atlantis has been restricted to two bodies of water, the Mediterranean Sea and the North Atlantic. Um, but Atlantis uh, is, is said to have been in the real ocean. And uh, we now understand that the world has only one ocean, the world ocean. In the middle of that ocean is Antarctica. It's right smack in the middle. And this is where we believe that the mapping of the, of the Earth took place. It's most famously known as Atlantis. Today, Antarctica is a frozen wasteland, virtually uninhabitable. According to geologists, it's been buried under ice for almost two million years. How could any civilization have thrived there only 12,000 years ago? A surprising discovery in Siberia may hold the answer. In 1977, a Russian bulldozer operator noticed a block of muddy ice containing a curious dark mass. On closer inspection, he was amazed to see the contours of a small elephant-like creature. He had discovered a perfectly preserved woolly mammoth. In a kind of zone of death, 
all over uh, the northern hemisphere, northern Siberia, northern Canada, we find the frozen carcasses of hundreds of thousands of large mammal species, mainly mammoths, but also woolly rhinos and other creatures of this kind. And when their stomach contents uh, are examined, as they have been, they're found to have been grazing on warm weather vegetation, and yet they're now positioned extremely close to the North Pole. The only theory which really explains this mystery is the theory of crustal displacement, that the land that they were on was shoved into a much colder climate very suddenly. Professor Charles Hapgood was fascinated by the fact that thousands of animals could be frozen completely in a brief moment of geological time, and that ancient maps of Antarctica suggest that it too was frozen over very quickly. For Hapgood, this could only be explained in one way that entire continents could rapidly change positions on the planet. About 12,000 years ago, there was a displacement of the Earth's crust. The entire outer shell of the Earth moved something like 2,000 miles. And uh, when the Earth's crust shifted, uh, all of Antarctica is encapsulated by the polar zone. And, and at the same time, uh, North America is released from the Arctic Circle and becomes uh, temperate. So we have ice melting in North America, ice forming in Antarctica. When Professor Hapgood first proposed this theory, it was met with silence from the scientific community, with one notable exception, Dr. Albert Einstein. I find your arguments very impressive and have the impression that your hypothesis is correct. One can hardly doubt that significant shifts of the crust of the Earth have taken place repeatedly and within a short time. This controversial theory is based on a well-accepted fact. The individual continents have been slowly drifting apart for millions of years. This is possible because the outer crust of the Earth floats upon a semi-liquid layer. Hapgood's theory of crustal displacement takes this principle one step further. It states that the entire crust of the Earth can shift in one piece, like the loose skin of an orange. Hapgood uh, documented three Earth crust displacements in the last 100,000 years. Um, we believe that uh, they happen every 41,000 years. The last one happened 11,500 years ago, so we're not due for another Earth crust displacement for 29,500 years. According to Hapgood's theory, this cataclysmic shift is caused by an imbalance of ice on the polar caps. Over time, ice builds up at the poles, reaching as much as two miles in thickness. The tremendous weight of the ice causes an imbalance on the globe. The ice shifts, dragging the outer crust and the continents in one piece to new positions. The polar caps are now in a warmer climate where they begin to melt while temperate lands are in the polar regions where they freeze and build up ice. If Hapgood's theory is possible and land masses can suddenly shift 2,000 miles, it might explain how an entire continent and its people could have been lost to history. I am convinced by the evidence that we are a species with amnesia. We have forgotten something of great importance from our own past. When we recover it, we'll realize for a start that our civilization isn't the apex of creation. It isn't the pinnacle towards which everything has been building throughout all of geological time. Rather, it's part of an up and down, a flow, that it's possible for a civilization to reach a very high level of advancement and be wiped out. This is something we've never really confronted and we need to confront it. We have met the experts and looked at the evidence that seems to contradict our conventional theories about the human race. Numerous artifacts indicate to some scientists that man could be millions of years old, throwing into question our descent from the apes. Ancient maps and megalithic architecture suggest that an advanced culture may have existed 12,000 years ago, their homeland wiped out by a cataclysm that rearranged the entire face of the planet. It's been said that man has made the climb from Stone Age to civilization more than once, and that our present time is just the latest in this cycle. 
But only if the evidence is allowed to speak for itself will we ever learn the truth about the mysterious origins of man.